In Shady Sands, Tandy helps her father Aradesh bring a new community and new life out of the broken remains of the world. They are responsible for the new California Republic, whose ideals spread across the land. Aradesh grieves for his slain daughter, Tandy but eventually build Shady Sands into a respected community which is prosperous for many years before his untimely death at the hands of a desert raider. With Aradesh dead and Tandy missing or killed, Shady Sands needs a new leader. After several elections, they find they cannot be governed by a single person and create a guiding council. Shortly afterwards, the raiders regroup and attack Shady Sands, burning the small community to the ground. The mutant army marches as far north as Shady Sands, raising the small town to the ground. The Brotherhood of Steel helps the other human outposts drive the mutant armies away with minimal loss of life on both sides of the conflict. The advanced technology of the Brotherhood is slowly reintroduced into New California with little disruption or chaos. The Brotherhood wisely remains out of the power structure and becomes a major research and development house. The Brotherhood of Steel, under new leadership after the death of Rhombus, becomes an overzealous techno-religious dictatorship. In twenty years, the Steel Plague devastates the newly formed New California Republic and starts a dark age that could last a thousand years. The Brotherhood of Steel repels the first wave of mutant invasion, but a traitor in their midst causes the Citadel to fall. Fortunately, the advanced technology is mastered slowly by the mutants, and they were unable to use it against you. Your mission beneath the mutant stronghold is successful. Your actions today will influence the outside world for years to come. The death of the Master was the first major step towards ending his mad dream of conquest and enforced peace. But it is the destruction of the Vats that neutralizes the mutant threat. Without the ability to create more mutants and enforce their harsh brand of justice, the mutant armies flee to the east, beyond the no-man's land. You managed to destroy the Vats. Then you killed the Master before he could realize his twisted plans. With the Master gone, his armies flee to the east in fear of retribution from the remaining normals. Your mission beneath the Cathedral is successful. Your actions today will influence the outside world for years to come. It is done. Vault 13 belongs to the Unity and the Master. Your knowledge of the vault defenses saved many mutant lives during the attack. You personally made the final kill when you took the life of the Overseer. You will certainly become one of the finest soldiers for the Unity, and your skills will see you rewarded often in the future. You are happy. But there remains the tiniest doubt of what could have been. Killian Darkwater takes firm control of Junktown drives out the last of Gizmo's kind, and then enforces his own brand of frontier justice. Life is fair and safe under his law. Junktown becomes the new boom town under the careful and profitable guidance of Don Gizmo. He profits the most, and continues to increase the size of his casino and the scope of his power, until he chokes to death while eating some iguana on a stick. The mutants are slowed, but not stopped, by the brave defenders of Junktown. When the army finishes their brutal siege, nothing of Junktown remains. With your assistance, Old Harold brings the ghoul population of the hub into equality with the humans. The two sides work together, and the hub prospers. Old Harold is still alive, as far as anyone knows. The hub disperses before the might of the mutant army and will never recover. The followers of the apocalypse rise to become a major influence in New California. With your help, they gain control of the L.A. Boneyard. 
the mutant armies, led into battle by the fierce super mutants, destroy the followers of the apocalypse. Barely human carrion feeders pick over the followers' remains. The ghouls of Necropolis learn how to maintain the repaired water pump and eventually rediscover many lost secrets of engineering. They form a business, selling this technology to other towns. The ghouls of Necropolis learn firsthand the final meaning of dehydration as their city succumbs to the desert sands and the water runs out. Without their water-purifying control chip, they do not survive. The mutant attack on Necropolis spares none of its ghoulish inhabitants. After the mutant armies advance, they leave a truly dead city behind them. Your involvement with the various places and people of the Wasteland is well documented by future historians. Only a single question remained unanswered. What happened to you? You march into the desert sands, leaving the shattered corpse of the Overseer behind you. Never to return to the vault. You march into the desert sands, leaving the vault behind you. Your help with Vault 15 launched the New California Republic's push to civilize its neighbors. Though there were many more obstacles to overcome, the NCR now had a foothold into the northern wastes. The failure of diplomacy at Vault 15 slowed the New California Republic's growth into the north. Embarrassed by the failure, President Tandy was replaced by Roger Weston. When the new government finally returned to Vault 15, they found nothing but a ghost town. Already weakened by the failure to annex Vault 15, President Tandy was forced to retire when her own Vice President Carlson accused her of complicity in Councilman Weston's death. As President, Carlson wasted no time in securing his grip on power. Under his rule, expansion slowed, since he was more concerned about lining his own pockets than furthering the cause of civilization. Shaken by the assassination of Vice President Carlson, right-wing elements seized control of Congress and set the new California Republic on a path to military rule. Eventually, the survivors of the Enclave found a new home in the ranks of the NCR. After the Enclave's destruction, the refugees of Arroyo and Vault 13 resettled, building a new community with the aid of the Garden of Eden Creation Kit. Finding themselves hundreds of miles from their vault, the members of Vault 13 chose to join the villagers in establishing a new community, and their technical expertise, combined with the villagers' survival skills, allowed the new settlement to grow and prosper. Two generations of the same bloodline were reunited, and their savior, the Chosen One, became Elder, presiding over the village in the years to come. Arroyo's Elder lived for many years after the destruction of the Enclave. She was pleased that the ancient separation between Vault 13 and the Vault Dweller had been reconciled, and many were the times she told you that she wished the Vault Dweller were alive to have seen the reconciliation take place. The Elder passed away in her sleep, certain that the safety of your new village had been secured and was now flourishing. Many of the older Arroyo residents believe that she now lives in the Vault of the Sky, telling the Vault Dwellers of your brave deeds. Armed with flares and clubs, the people of Modoc invaded the Slag's underground city. The Slag's were quickly defeated, and the Modoc residents slaughtered every man, woman, and child they found. Rumor of this vicious attack spread far and wide, and fear motivated Modoc's neighbors to attack and destroy the town. Relations between the Slags and the residents of Modoc flourished. Between the two peoples, Modoc prospered and became a major farming community, supplying all the outlying regions with food. The extermination of the Slags only created new problems for Modoc. Unable to find the Slags' underground cistern to sustain the crops, Modoc was hit hard by the resultant drought. Over the next several years, 
the people of Modoc either moved away or died of starvation. Without any viable economy, the den soon vanished into the wasteland. With Metzger gone, Avery disappeared from the area. Becky's casino bar grew quickly, and Rebecca Dyer's reputation as an honest casino and bar owner brought her the business needed to buy out her competition and expand. The den flourished, and it soon gained a reputation for being a tough but honest community. Metzger's business in the trade soon faded with the removal of the Mordino family. The den continued to attract criminals, and Metzger's business practices delved further into drugs and prostitution. The den soon became a rallying point and a safe haven for raiders. Metzger's slave trade in the den expanded greatly, giving him influence and power throughout most of the area. Breeding pens were started, and eventually, no one was safe from the threat of being enslaved. Travelers avoided the den, hearing of the evils committed within its walls. Over the next few years, the background radiation from Gecko's power plant began to cause mutations in the Vault City population forcing the citizens to relocate to NCR. NCR, however, recalling past animosity, relegated the Vault City refugees to the status of second-class citizens. The correspondence between NCR and Vault City continued, and a few years after the destruction of the Enclave, Roger Weston assumed the head of the NCR Council. He immediately set limits for NCR's expansion north, and in a landmark settlement, passed an amendment that formally recognized Volt City's independence. Shortly after this settlement, Weston suffered a heart attack and retired from politics. He moved north to Volt City for medical treatment and eventually married Joanne Lynette in the following year. In the years to come, Volt City suffered greatly from raider attacks. Eventually, the situation grew so desperate, the citizens were forced to request aid from NCR. Within a month, a large detachment of the NCR's military was stationed in Vault City. The military presence quickly became an occupation force, and Vault City became the first of NCR's border territories. In the years following the destruction of the Enclave, Vault City continued to stagnate, choking on its own isolationism. Its Vault-A generator, which was never intended to support such a large population, prevented Vault City's necessary expansion. Eventually, the city was absorbed by NCR, which had spread steadily northward since its founding. The slaughter of Vault City has become the stuff of legend. One day it was a thriving community, and the next, the body of its citizens lay strewn throughout the streets. It looked as if raiders had sacked the city, but no bodies of the attackers were ever found. Their vault was plundered of all its technology, and refugees from Gecko soon moved into the broken walls of the city. The slaughter of Vault City has become the stuff of legend. One day it was a thriving community, and the next, the body of its citizens lay strewn throughout the streets. It looked as if raiders had sacked the city, but no bodies of the attackers were ever found. Their vault was plundered of all its technology and the inhabitants of Gecko soon moved into the broken walls of the city. In a few short months, they had rebuilt the city and restored much of the systems that had been damaged by the raiders. The Gecko reactor meltdown had terrible consequences for the region. The resultant radioactivity and heat emanating from the reactor killed every living creature within a 10-kilometer radius and poisoned the area for years to come. Vault City's perceived threat from the peaceful ghouls of Gecko was at an end. Repairing Gecko's power plant prevented any further radioactivity from leaking into Vault City's groundwater. Though this eased tensions between the two communities, they still maintain an uneasy truce. Optimizing Gecko's reactor created a power surplus in Gecko. The Vault City Council, unable to expand because of their limited power supply, yielded to internal pressure and was forced to take over Gecko to control the reactor. The peaceful ghouls of Gecko became slaves and spent the rest of their lives serving Vault City. 
Optimizing Gecko's power plant became the first step in forging a spirit of cooperation between Gecko and Vault City. Gecko's increased power production became instrumental in helping Vault City's expansion. The harsh xenophobia of many of Vault City's leaders faded into obscurity, while ghoul and human labored side by side to create a center of learning and tolerance where once had stood only enmity and distrust. Eventually, the citizens of Vault City tired of having their groundwater radiated by the ghoul's leaking atomic reactor in Gecko. In a wave of xenophobic fear and hatred, the well-armed soldiers of Vault City slaughtered the peaceful ghouls and shut down the reactor for good. Unable to harness any additional sources of power, Vault City eventually stagnated and died, itself a victim of its own hatred. You still hear mention of Harold from time to time. Apparently, the tree growing from his head has gotten larger, and if rumors are to be believed, fruit is growing from it. The seeds are said to be remarkably tough, and several of them have taken root even in the most barren stretches of the wasteland. The inhabitants of New Reno were slaughtered, and the city collapsed into ruin. No lights shine there now. The streets home only to packs of wild dogs and vultures. The desert tribes avoid the giant graveyard, claiming the city is haunted by evil spirits. Some say the destruction of New Reno was a judgment from a higher power. In the years following the destruction of the Enclave, a new family arose in New Reno, following the example of a simple tribal that had once visited their city. They were few in number, but surprisingly resourceful. Driven by religious fervor, they took control of New Reno and put the other families to the spear. After their victory, they sent out many messengers across Northern California, looking for their founder, without success. Many felt that the founder had been taken by the fortune spirits and now dwelled in a golden casino paradise in the sky. Not long after the destruction of the Enclave, the Bishop family of New Reno was blessed with a child. This child seemed to have little in common with the bishops, preferring instead to spend his days exploring the wastes. When he turned thirteen, he seized control of the Bishop family and led them to victory over the remaining New Reno families. He died quietly in his sleep at the age of seventy-three, never having known his real father. The Bishop family of New Reno rose to prominence over the next few years, forming a strong political alliance with the New California Republic and Vault City. Many mysterious deaths and closed-door proceedings surrounded the formation of the alliance. But in the end, New Reno became part of the civilized world. The other families were soon absorbed, and New Reno became a prime tourist location for the New Republic. In the decades after the Alliance, several bishops rose to political power and were instrumental in the passage of several amendments protecting gambling rights and prostitution. The Salvatore family of New Reno, having profited from their ties to Navarro, used their laser weaponry to burn the other families into submission. The resultant massacre was dubbed Ash Friday and is still celebrated in New Reno to this day. The Mordino family grew greatly in power as Jet's influence spread across Northern California. Within a year, they had seized control of New Reno and expanded their empire, absorbing the Den and other surrounding areas. There was little violence in the conquest, as Jet had weakened all resistance to Mordino rule. With their Jet production halted with the discovery of a cure, the Mordino family quickly lost ground in New Reno and were absorbed by the other families. Most became enforcers or slaves, and the name Mordino was soon forgotten. Less than a month after the Enclave's destruction, a mob war broke out in New Reno streets. The Wrights, armed with an arsenal of weaponry that dated back to the pre-war years, leveled the casinos of the other families with rocket launchers. The mob war 
was clocked as lasting a little over 43 minutes, and when the smoke cleared, half of New Reno had been demolished. To this day, it is commonly taught that the Wright family were the founders of New Reno. Within months after the Enclave's destruction, war broke out in New Reno streets. The Wrights, believing the Mordinos responsible for the death of one of their family, attacked the Desperado Casino. The running gun battle that ensued lasted little more than a day, and the Wrights were massacred to the last woman and child. Their mansion lies vacant now, and there are few New Reno inhabitants who remembered who once lived there. Within a year of the Enclave's destruction, the Wright family turned from criminal activity to legitimate pursuits. Several schools and churches were established in New Reno, along with a law enforcement body that crippled the influence of the families. Though New Reno lost much of its edge, the city obtained a certain solidity that appealed to newcomers. Many came to Reno not to visit, but to live, and the population increased threefold. Today, the test scores of New Reno High School graduates are greater than many Californian schools before the war. Though the Wright family never completely recovered from Richard's death, the knowledge that their killer had been brought to justice eased their troubled sleep. Though a murderer had been found and punished, the true identity of the man who had killed Mr. Wright's son was never discovered. The murder was never spoken of again and became a closed chapter in the Wright family history. Myron died less than a year after the defeat of the Enclave, stabbed by a jet addict while drinking in the den. His discovery of jet was quickly forgotten, and now there is no one who remembers his name. After Doc Johnson helped treat the miners during the Great Jet Scare, the citizens of Vault City voted Doc Johnson into the mayor's seat. Under the doctor's patient hand, Redding forged closer ties with Vault City until, some years later, Vault City annexed Redding, granting Vault City's citizenship to only 10% of Redding's population. Several years after the Chosen One sold the excavator chip to dangerous Dan McGrew, Dan used the superior production of his Morning Star Mine to buy the Cocoa Weef Mine and then to reopen the great Winnemingo Mine. Dan then used his industrial clout to forge an alliance of convenience with the families of New Reno, trading gold in return for protection. Several years after buying the excavator chip from the Chosen One, Marge LaBarge was able to purchase and control both the Morning Star and the newly opened Cocoa Weef mines. Marge was an easy choice for mayor, and using her new political power, she made Redding join the growing New California Republic in return for a seat in the NCR's Hall of Congress. The gold-producing town of Reading soon found itself in the unenviable position of a scrap of meat being torn by three jealous vultures. Sooner than many would have expected, there was nothing left of the scrap that was once Reading. For Vault City, New Reno, and the New California Republic had laid waste to what was once an area of plenty. Nothing now exists but the desiccated husk of what was once Redding. The destruction of the mutants ensured the death of the town. Without their strength and ability to withstand the toxins within the mine, the valuable ore proved unattainable. Those who caused this destruction rejoiced at first, until they realized the foolishness of what they had done. They struggled to keep the community flourishing, but to no avail. The winds and the waste scoured broken hills from the map. With the destruction of the conspiracy to destroy the mutants, broken hills began to thrive. Then the uranium ran out. The city, having lost its sole reason for existing, slowly dispersed. The residents carried their riches with them, leaving the place a windswept, desolate ghost town. A few holdouts remained, attempting to eke out a pathetic existence, but eventually, they too disappeared. Shortly after your last departure, the powder keg of racial tension in Broken Hills exploded. Racist humans fought against mutants, ghouls, 
and humans who sided with the mutants. The few survivors of the battle destroyed the mine, ensuring no one else could profit by it, and disappeared into the wastes. Inspired by your example, Marcus eventually traveled across the great mountains to the east, searching for other refugees from the Master's army. You never heard from him again. With the support of the New California Republic, the Vault 15 squatters soon became self-sufficient and productive members of society. The squatters of Vault 15 continued their meaningless, non-productive lives. No one noticed when the desert wastes finally claimed the squat. With your aid, the Death Claws of Vault 13 became a thriving community. When the Vault could no longer hold their numbers, a peaceful campaign of expansion was launched to claim the surrounding lands. By eliminating the Death Claws of Vault 13, you banished yet another species of the Realms of Extinction, proving once again that genocide is a viable solution to any problem. The Shi, demoralized and leaderless after your rampage through their town, slowly drifted apart. They blended into other towns, hoping to find a place free from the depredations of killers. The strain of plant the scientists were growing mutated, gaining a measure of sentience. It killed the laboratory technicians and took over the laboratory in which it was first conceived. It took a massive concentration of resources to crush the being. And this left the she poverty-stricken. They disappeared into the wastes. The she flourished, creating a botanical scourge on the radiation surrounding their beloved town. Though this vine could not grow in other soils, the she took care to nourish it in their lands. They continued to grow in strength and prominence, forming the basis of a new empire. The scientists grew tired of waiting for the Star Father to come for them or provide the fuel they needed. Using a cheap derivative fuel, they launched an abortive effort to reach the stars themselves. Their shuttle exploded moments after takeoff. The scientists, unable to figure out how to create an airtight seal on their ship, went ahead and launched it anyway, believing that the Star Father would protect them once they left Earth's atmosphere. They perished in orbit. The scientists ensured a safe and speedy launch of the Quetzal. Unfortunately, they didn't account for having recycled air aboard their ship, and they perished in orbit. As for the tanker vagrants, well, as vagrants do, they drifted on. The destruction of the Enclave erased all trace of President Richardson from history. Now the title of President is used simply as a boogeyman to frighten children. Deep in the warrior's heart, 
the decision had been made long ago to forfeit one's life for the security of others. What nobler end could there be? Sacrifices were always expected, but to lose one's mortal shell and join with a machine is not an ending. Instead, it is a new beginning, revolving around the rebirth of humanity. The first command to speed through the new calculator's relays is the disabling of the active robotic forces, averting the sterilization of all life on the continent. The warrior's mind had proven itself exceptional time and again in the field of battle. Now, working in conjunction with the calculator's sheer processing power, a union between the Brotherhood of Steel and the robotic forces quickly takes shape. The region sees new laws established to ease humanity back into civilized life. Laws that are strictly enforced by the combined patrols of Brotherhood soldiers and pacification robots. To speed the unification process, discrimination against mutates is outlawed. Many prejudices are eliminated through education or the harsh implementation of Brotherhood justice. The willingness to overcome differences opens avenues of recruitment that would have otherwise remained unutilized. Mutated creatures that wish to live in peace under the new regime are welcomed, though hesitantly, into the population. Old hatreds and fears are soon forgotten as the task at hand becomes apparent. Humans, ghouls, super mutants, and death claws all work together to begin transforming the wastelands into a post-nuclear utopia. The combined knowledge of the Brotherhood and Calculator's databases are a powerful tool for reshaping the world, and no time is wasted. Technology is slowly reintroduced into the land. Irrigation systems are established, bringing water to the barren soils for the first time in decades. New settlements spring up as land becomes fertile once again, with places of learning becoming the hubs of the fledgling civilization. A combination of old world science with new world wisdom paves the way to higher understanding and unity among the population. The new regime begins to expand across the wasteland, absorbing towns and villages, and quickly dispatching those that would halt progress. Soon, the Brotherhood is protector to a string of settlements. As the Brotherhood's power grows, so does its hold on the wasteland. But one question remains. What will happen when this young civilization encounters the original, knowledge-hoarding Brotherhood of Steel? The scribes and elders prepare for the meeting and hope to put differences in the past as the future of mankind hangs in the balance. But that is a battle for another day and perhaps another hero. Having weighed the options, the warrior purposefully strides into the calculator's brain-removing mechanism. While this union of mind and machine represents an end to the hero's mortal shell, it also promises rebirth with the power and resources essential to rescue civilization from the brink of oblivion. With the mind of the warrior working in conjunction with the ancient machine's sheer processing power, a new and potent calculator thunders into existence. Years of neglected faults and decay are repaired almost instantly, becoming the catalyst for dozens of defunct systems to flash back into full operation. The calculator becomes whole for the first time since its conception. Contact is immediately established with the Brotherhood Elders, and an alliance is formed. But while no longer an opponent, the calculator chooses to not directly serve the Brotherhood. A delegation of the top Brotherhood Elders departs for Vault Zero to discuss details of the new alliance. They never reach their destination. Brotherhood soldiers and robots alike are dispatched to investigate. However, no traces of the ill-fated expedition were found. The impact on Brotherhood morale was devastating. For every soldier knows, leaders define rules, and rules shape the Brotherhood. The calculator quickly integrates with the surviving Brotherhood leaders. Protocol robots infused with knowledge of Brotherhood procedure 
begin to handle operations in Brotherhood outposts. Behemoth robots are sent to bunkers and allied towns to ease the strain of basic needs like patrols while maintaining a military show of force to keep outlaws at bay. Soon, the Alliance is discarded with all forces now under one computerized leader. The Brotherhood is, once again, reborn. To speed the unification process, discrimination against mutates is outlawed. The new Brotherhood views these creatures as a valuable resource instead of a threat to be eliminated. Old hatreds and fears are soon set aside as humans, ghouls, super mutants, and death claws work together to carry out the Brotherhood's plans for transforming the wastelands into a post-nuclear utopia. The new regime begins to expand across the wasteland, absorbing towns and villages, and quickly dispatching those that would halt progress. Soon, the Brotherhood is protector to a string of settlements with entire regions under its influence. As the calculator's power grows, so does its hold on the continent. But one question remains. What will happen when this new force encounters the original knowledge-hoarding Brotherhood of Steel? In the depths of Vault Zero, the calculator processes millions of possible scenarios in preparation for the inevitable meeting. It will not be as easy to eliminate the original West Coast Brotherhood elders but it must be done, for in the end, there can only be one leader. One that is willing to sacrifice anything or anyone to unify the wasteland. When the acrid smoke clears, nothing remains of the entity known as the calculator, except burnt wires and broken valves. It is a decisive victory for humanity, for at the crucial point in the raging battle, the robots were stopped dead in their course of destruction. The warrior can only ponder on the lost opportunity that the destruction of such a technological marvel represents. History has shown that even the victors of battle have some regrets, but sometimes one must move forward. The Brotherhood is quick to establish Vault Zero as its main base of operations. Although much destruction was wrought here, it still represents a massive storehouse of knowledge and technology. The ancient structure becomes the central hub of operations, coordinating between outposts far and near, and reinforcing their supply lines and transport routes across the countryside, ironically mimicking the original purpose of their defeated enemy. Recruitment and education of the local tribal and village populations becomes the all-important mission of the depleted and wounded Brotherhood. But the education is not one-sided. After generations of surviving in the harshness of the wastelands, the indigenous people are in tune with the land. They have valuable lessons to teach those immersed solely in technology, lessons of nature and balance that the Brotherhood had previously neglected. Not all of the Wasteland's inhabitants are sharing the same noble purpose. Opportunistic raiders and bandits enjoy the fruits of a recovering, war-torn brotherhood. Patrols are scarce and in smaller numbers than the thieves remember encountering in the past as the brotherhood focuses on consolidating its power base. Several frontier outposts are lost as the brotherhood finds they are fighting a guerrilla war without the support of large numbers. But adversity and hardship are as familiar to the Brotherhood as discipline and knowledge, and they learn their lessons quickly. With a new power over this region comes a new responsibility. All plans for re-establishing contact with the West are postponed indefinitely. Recruitment begins anew, and the initiate ranks swell. All military efforts are then concentrated on uprooting all outlaw predators in the region, finally making it safe for the Brotherhood and its allies. In time, the Brotherhood once again rules the land. Resources are then allocated to expansion and development. Technology becomes more widespread, with irrigation systems established to make the nuclear blasted land fertile. Humanity once again starts to prosper. The hero, the warrior of the Brotherhood, 
now a general, shares the burden and the satisfaction of overseeing civilization's development. The Brotherhood of Steel has come through the trials of this region and emerged scarred, but wiser. It will be decades before a reunion is possible between the old Brotherhood and the new Brotherhood regime. In that time, there are new alliances to be made, new battles to be fought, new victories to be had. But that is a tale for another day. The general, driven by the memory of his wife and convinced by your words, boldly steps into the chamber. His brain is removed once again and placed into a specially constructed container. Now the sole organic influence on the calculator's supercomputer neural network, he finds himself united with an enemy he had sworn to destroy. His only objective is to restore order to the chaotic wastes and provide his beloved wife with the security he had promised so long ago. The new calculator dedicates its existence to the rescuing of pure blood humanity from the brink of destruction. Order is established with the Brotherhood soldiers and calculator robots enforcing new laws and spearheading the task of rebuilding and re-educating mankind. The first step is to comfort the battle-weary region. Combined groups of Brotherhood soldiers and robots are dispatched to patrol troubled areas. These forces are charged with the task of dealing the bandit lords a blow that will take them years to recover from. Technology is slowly reintroduced into the land. Irrigation systems are established, bringing water to the barren soils for the first time in decades. New settlements spring up as trade routes become safe from attacks. Once again, humanity begins to prosper. For the various mutates of the land, their destiny is somewhat darker. All known genetic divergence are immediately rounded up into internment camps and registered. Those that comply are forced to endure harsh conditions in labor gulags, where their unique abilities are exploited in tasks considered too dangerous or simply beneath pure blood humans. Humans who speak out against this new system are disciplined or silenced. Those mutants who choose to flee are ruthlessly hunted like animals. These unfortunates are captured, killed, and displayed across the region as a gruesome reminder to all impure life forms that disobedience from lesser creatures will be met with uncompromising punishment. Small factions of humans, defiant of the new Brotherhood dictatorship, join their outcast cousins to form the Mutant Liberation Army. Any creatures suspected of supporting this outlawed faction are quickly rounded up and interrogated by the General's hand-picked inquisitors. Many are never seen again. But for every disappearance, for every public execution by the new regime, another rebel joins the outlaw movement. Soon, the Brotherhood finds itself under repeated attack. The Mutant Liberation Army attempts to utilize guerrilla tactics to offset the overwhelming combined force of robot and Brotherhood soldiers. The rebels fight for many reasons now, revenge, freedom, and a chance for a better life. Some join the battle because waging war is all they know. It is a struggle they are destined to lose. For humanity, however, progress is made. It comes slowly at first, for time is an ingredient as important as order and determination when great changes are to be made. Soon, without the required resources and firepower, the Mutant Liberation Army is driven west, back to an area where many of them met bitter defeat not long ago. Their actions becoming more and more desperate when they realize they are being driven back into a region controlled by the Old Brotherhood. Humanity rules the land again, while the mutates have nothing but death. It lies waiting over every hill, behind every rock, through every crosshair. They are without justice. They are without hope. Such is life in the wasteland.
And so it was that the lone wanderer ventured forth from Vault 101, intent on discovering the fate of a father who had once sacrificed the future of humanity for that of his only child. The Capital Wasteland proved a cruel, inhospitable place, but the Lone Wanderer refused to surrender to the vices that had claimed so many others. The values passed on from father to child, selflessness, compassion, honor, guided this noble soul through countless trials and trials. But it was not until the end of this long road that the Lone Wanderer learned the true meaning of that greatest of virtues, sacrifice. Stepping into the irradiated control chamber of Project Purity, the child followed the example of the father, sacrificing life itself for the greater good of mankind. Sadly, when selected by the sinister president to be his instrument of annihilation, the wanderer agreed. Humanity would be preserved, but only in its purest form. The waters of life flowed at last, but the virus contained within soon eradicated all those deemed unworthy of salvation. The capital wasteland, despite its progress, became a graveyard. So ends the story of the Lone Wanderer, who stepped through the great door of Vault 101 and into the annals of legend. But the tale of humanity will never come to a close, for the struggle of survival is a war without end. And war... War never changes. And so it was that the Lone Wanderer ventured forth from Vault 101, intent on discovering the fate of a father who had once sacrificed the future of humanity for that of his only child. The Capital Wasteland proved a cruel, inhospitable place, but the Lone Wanderer refused to surrender to the vices that had claimed so many others. The values passed on from father to child. Selflessness, compassion, honor guided this noble soul through countless trials and triumphs. But it was not until the end of this long road that the Lone Wanderer learned the true meaning of that greatest of virtues, sacrifice. Stepping into the irradiated control chamber of Project Purity, the child followed the example of the father, sacrificing life itself for the greater good of mankind. Thankfully, when selected by the sinister president to be his instrument of annihilation, the Wanderer refused. Humanity, with all its flaws, was deemed worthy of preservation. The waters of life flowed at last, free and pure for any and all. The capital wasteland, at long last, was saved. So ends the story of the Lone Wanderer, who stepped through the great door of Vault 101 and into the annals of legend. But the tale of humanity will never come to a close, for the struggle of survival is a war without end. And war... War never changes. And so it was that the Lone Wanderer ventured forth from Vault 101, intent on discovering the fate of a father who had once sacrificed the future of humanity for that of his only child. The Capital Wasteland proved a cruel, 
inhospitable place. But the lone wanderer refused to surrender to the vices that had claimed so many others. The values passed on from father to child. Selflessness, compassion, honor guided this noble soul through countless trials and triumphs. It was not until the end of this long road that the lone wanderer was faced with that greatest of virtues, sacrifice. But the child refused to follow the father's selfless example, instead allowing a true hero to venture into the irradiated control chamber of Project Purity and sacrifice her own life for the greater good of mankind. Thankfully, when selected by the sinister president to be his instrument of annihilation, the wanderer refused. Humanity, with all its flaws, was deemed worthy of preservation. The waters of life flowed at last, free and pure for any and all. The capital wasteland, at long last, was saved. So ends the story of the Lone Wanderer, who stepped through the great door of Vault 101 and into the annals of legend. But the tale of humanity will never come to a close, for the struggle of survival is a war without end. And war... War never changes. And so it was that the Lone Wanderer ventured forth from Vault 101, intent on discovering the fate of a father who had once sacrificed the future of humanity for that of his only child. The Capital Wasteland proved a cruel, inhospitable place, but the Lone Wanderer refused to surrender to the vices that had claimed so many others. The values passed on from father to child. Selflessness, compassion, honor guided this noble soul through countless trials and triumphs. It was not until the end of this long road that the lone wanderer was faced with that greatest of virtues, sacrifice. But the child refused to follow the father's selfless example, instead allowing a true hero to venture into the irradiated control chamber of Project Purity. Thankfully, when selected by the sinister president to be his instrument of annihilation, the wanderer refused. Humanity, with all its flaws, was deemed worthy of preservation. The waters of life flowed at last, free and pure for any and all. The capital wasteland, at long last, was saved. So ends the story of the Lone Wanderer, who stepped through the great door of Vault 101 and into the annals of legend. But the tale of humanity will never come to a close, for the struggle of survival is a war without end. And war... War never changes. And so the courier who had cheated death in the cemetery outside Good Springs cheated death once again, and the Mojave Wasteland was forever changed. The New California Republic celebrated its second victory at Hoover Dam, establishing definitive control over the entire Mojave Wasteland. Soon after, they negotiated terms to annex the Strip, Freeside, and many surrounding communities. The Mojave Wasteland, at long last, 
had entirely fallen under the NCR's banner. The courier, fair and even-handed in his dealings throughout the wasteland, was honored by the NCR for his support of the military at Hoover Dam. He was presented with the Golden Branch, the highest civilian decoration given by the Republic. With the help of the Gunrunners, the Boomers developed a healthy trading relationship with the NCR. Eventually, the Boomers began wandering out into the wasteland while still preventing outsiders from entering Nellis. The Brotherhood and the NCR in the Mojave Wasteland declared an official truce, despite continued hostilities between the two in the West. As per their agreement, the NCR handed over all suits of salvaged power armor, and in return, the Brotherhood helped patrol I-15 and Highway 95. After the NCR's victory at the dam, the followers of the Apocalypse were pushed out of Old Mormon Fort during its occupation by NCR forces. NCR further encouraged them to leave Outer Vegas entirely, and the followers had no choice but to comply. Good Springs saw more trade along I-15 after NCR gained control of the Mojave Wasteland, but with that came a heavy burden of the Republic's taxes. Some old-timers, unable to handle the cost, were forced to move on, grumbling all the while. After the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, the Great Khans returned for a time to Red Rock Canyon. The NCR's pressing need to expand proved greater than its promise of amnesty, and before long the government decided the Khans had to go. The surviving Great Khans were relocated to an isolated barren reservation, well north of NCR trade routes. Thanks to the Courier and Lily, a cure for the Nightkin schizophrenia was found shortly after Dr. Henry's experiment concluded. Nightkin and other super mutants in the wasteland flocked to Jacobstown, and the town became known as a haven where a mutant could find peace. Lily continued to take her medicine at half doses, and although she remembered her grandchildren, her mind remained muddled and confused. Eventually, she parted ways with the courier and traveled west, seeking the remnants of her past. After the NCR victory at Hoover Dam, the temporary truce between them and the kings blossomed into a full-scale relief effort for the people. While the NCR made repeated entreaties that Freeside join the Republic, the kings steadfastly maintained their independence. Revitalized by Violetta's brain, Rex eventually learned to balance the memories of his old life with Violetta's experiences among the brutal fiends. His mind had difficulty adjusting, but Rex eventually found peace with his new, more vicious self. Though Novak was a low-priority target for the Legion, many of Novak's citizens died in its defense. In the weeks that followed, several bright followers returned to Novak to help restore its defenses, allowing it to remain independent of NCR. Looking for a place where he could be of some use, Boone found himself re-enlisting with his old unit. Though his regrets remained in his thoughts, they coalesced into a purpose, and Boone embraced it. He spent his leave time hunting down slavers in the desert, his first recon beret the last thing they never saw. After Hoover Dam, the leaderless powder gangers at the correctional facility vanished into the wastes leaving the prison empty. The correctional facility became another abandoned ruin in the wasteland, its carcass occasionally picked over by enterprising prospectors. Armed with a wide array of improvised explosives and stolen weapons, the Vault 19 powder gang tormented the Mojave wasteland for years. Citizens of the NCR were favorite targets, and they always suffered the worst fates. After Hoover Dam, Sheriff Myers runs Prim with his own style of frontier justice. He deals with most folks fairly, but now and then someone winds up dead with little to no evidence against him. And so the courier's road came to an end, for now. In the new world of the Mojave Wasteland, Fighting continued, blood was spilled, and many lived and died just as they had in the old world. Because war, war never changes. And so the courier who had cheated death in the cemetery outside Good Springs cheated death once again.
and the Mojave wasteland was forever changed. Caesar entered the Strip as though it was his triumph. The Legion pushed the NCR out of New Vegas entirely, driving them back to the Mojave outpost. The Legion occupied all major locations, enslaving much of the population and peacefully lording over the rest. Under the Legion's banner, civilization, unforgiving as it was, finally came to the Mojave Wasteland. The Courier, a mercenary at heart, helped the Legion achieve victory at Hoover Dam. Caesar honored him with a golden coin, minted in celebration of his contributions and distributed throughout the wasteland. Tabitha and Rhonda went east, through Caesar's land. Occasionally, tales of their exploits found their way back west, though few believed them. Eventually, the stories concerning the duo were collected and published, and proved to be quite popular with children. Invigorated by his travels with the courier, Raul once more took up his guns in memory of his lost Rafaela. Soon after, the Mojave was filled with tales of the ghost vaquero who hunts down those who prey on the weak. Cautious after the boomer's display of power at Hoover Dam, Caesar chose to leave the boomers alone. The boomers remained isolated, but have been seen flying over the Mojave Desert from time to time. Buried beneath tons of rubble, the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel was no more. Those few who were outside the Hidden Valley bunker when it was destroyed settled into new lives, or headed west to find a new chapter to join. Though she'd seen the writing on the wall, the destruction of the Mojave Brotherhood came far more suddenly than Veronica had expected. The news devastated her. Despite her best efforts to leave her past behind, she found herself compelled to make one final journey to Hidden Valley. There, she paid her last respects to the only family she had ever known. Their leaders destroyed by the Courier, the fiends scattered throughout the wasteland. Without the organization of Motor Runner, Cook Cook, Violet, and Driver Nephi, they were easy prey. After the Legion's victory, Caesar, out of a strange respect for his old fellows, allowed the followers safe passage out of the wasteland. Reluctantly, the followers accepted the offer and abandoned Old Mormon Fort to the Legion. Tricked by the Courier and imprisoned by the Legion, Arcade remained Caesar's personal physician for several years. Caesar grew fond of speaking with such an educated man on philosophical matters. Arcade became his unwilling intellectual sparring partner. After years of such servitude, during an unguarded moment, Arcade used a surgical scalpel in his bare hands to disembowel himself. Lacking any other skilled medical personnel, the Legion was unable to prevent his death. Caesar mourned his loss for months. The Legion, preoccupied with its acquisition of New Vegas, scarcely took notice of the town of Good Springs. Many locals moved on, fearful of Caesar's long shadow. Only the old and the stubborn remained. Merciless in their assault on the NCR, the remnants struck fear into the hearts of even the centurions at Hoover Dam. Well aware of the full extent of their power, Caesar commanded his troops to not pursue them. And so the courier's road came to an end, for now. In the new world of the Mojave Wasteland, fighting continued, blood was spilled, and many lived and died just as they had in the old world. Because war, war never changes. And so the courier who had cheated death in the cemetery outside Good Springs cheated death once again, and the Mojave Wasteland was forever changed. The courier, with the aid of Yes Man, drove both the Legion and the NCR from Hoover Dam, securing New Vegas' independence from both factions. With Mr. House out of the picture, part of the Securitron army was diverted to the Strip to keep order. Any chaos on the streets was ended, quickly. Chaos became uncertainty, then acceptance with minimal loss of life. New Vegas assumed its position as an independent power in the Mojave. Supporting the ideals of independence, the courier was recognized as the man responsible for a truly free New Vegas. He ensured Mr. House's tyranny was broken and neither Caesar's Legion nor NCR would ever gain control over New Vegas. Tabitha and Rhonda went east, through Caesar's land, 
Occasionally, tales of their exploits found their way back west, though few believed them. Eventually, the stories concerning the duo were collected and published, and proved to be quite popular with children. Invigorated by his travels with the courier, Raul once more took up his guns in memory of his lost Rafaela. Soon after, the Mojave was filled with tales of the ghost vaquero who hunts down those who prey on the weak. Though the wasteland became anarchic after Hoover Dam, the boomer's display of power dissuaded fortune seekers from attempting to penetrate Nellis. Despite her departure from the group, the Brotherhood's peace treaty with NCR came as some relief to Veronica. Though she remained friendly with surface patrols, she was never again permitted to enter the bunker she once called home. Fearing for the safety of anyone she associated with, she continued her solitary life as a scavenger. Their leaders destroyed by the courier, the fiends scattered throughout the wasteland. Without the organization of motor runner, cook cook, violet, and driver Nephi, they were easy prey. After the courier ensured New Vegas remained free, the followers found that independent Vegas was even more unstable and violent than before. Old Mormon Fort became excessively burdened by the influx of patients, struggling to provide even the most basic of services. With New Vegas's independence formally declared, Good Springs thrived. More travelers stopped by Good Springs on their way to and from the Strip, and the locals grew prosperous from the traffic. After their bold arrival at Hoover Dam, the remnants disappeared as quickly as they came. Legends of their power spread throughout the Southwest, a reminder of why people once feared the sight of vertebrates in the sky. And so the courier's road came to an end, for now. In the new world of the Mojave Wasteland, fighting continued, blood was spilled, and many lived and died just as they had in the old world. And so the courier who had cheated death in the cemetery outside Good Springs cheated death once again and the Mojave Wasteland was forever changed. Mr. House's Securitron army took control of Hoover Dam and the Strip, pushing both the Legion and the exhausted NCR out of New Vegas. Mr. House continued to run New Vegas his way, a despotic vision of pre-war glory. The streets were orderly, efficient, cold. New Vegas continued to be the sole place in the Wasteland where fortunes were won and lost in the blink of an eye. The courier, fair and kind-hearted to those in the wasteland, ensured that Mr. House would keep New Vegas stable and secure for future generations. Mr. House afforded him every luxury at his disposal in the Lucky 38, out of gratitude and a quiet sense of pride for his choice in lieutenants. Though some super mutants in Nightkin continued to journey to the legendary Utopitha, they found little trace of its existence. Some eventually found their way to Jacobstown, but many wandered off into the wastes, confused and disheartened. Still grappling with self-doubt over his usefulness in the face of old age, Raoul was never able to find peace with himself. Eventually, he left the Mojave and assumed a new name, as he had done so many times before. Mr. House showed little interest on the boomers, who eventually began venturing out to Nellis, to meet and trade with travelers. Buried beneath tons of rubble, the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel was no more. Those few who were outside the Hidden Valley bunker when it was destroyed settled into new lives or headed west to find a new chapter to join. The death of the Mojave Brotherhood came much too soon for Veronica, and in their absence, she felt truly lost. Yet in its wake, she took small comfort in her decision to remain by their side through their few remaining days. Their leaders destroyed by the courier, the fiends scattered throughout the wasteland. Without the organization of motor runner, cook cook, violet, and driver Nephi, they were easy prey. After Mr. House gained control of New Vegas, he sent a Securitron to Good Springs as a token of appreciation for helping the courier. Victor was a mixed blessing, however as he continually monitored the town for Mr. House. Despite NCR's pledge to support Prim, they abandoned the town after their loss to Mr. House. As repayment for their NCR loyalty, 
Mr. House sends Securitrons to Prim to protect it and collect heavy taxes from its citizens. And so the Courier's Road came to an end, for now. In the new world of the Mojave Wasteland, fighting continued, blood was spilled, and many lived and died just as they had in the old world. Because war, war never changes. I've lost Sean, all over again. I close my eyes, I see my life before all of this, before the bombs. Everything can change in an instant, and the future you plan for yourself shifts, whether or not you're ready. At some point, it happens to all of us. This wasn't the world I wanted, but it was the one I found myself in. The Commonwealth. My home. Ripped apart and put back together. I thought, I hoped, I could find my family, cheat time, make us whole again. The way we were. But now I know. I know I can't go back. I know the world has changed. That the road ahead will be hard. This time, I'm ready. Because I know war. War never changes. I can feel it wash over me. The heat, the force, the radiation. Fear. It's the end of the world all over again. I close my eyes. I see my life before all of this. Before the bombs. Everything can change in an instant. And the future you plan for yourself shifts whether or not you're ready. At some point, it happens to all of us. This wasn't the world I wanted, but it was the one I found myself in. The Commonwealth. My home. Ripped apart and put back together. I thought, I hoped, I could find my family, cheat time, make us whole again. The way we were. But now I know. I know I can't go back. I know the world has changed, that the road ahead will be hard. This time, I'm ready. Because I know war. War never changes. I can feel it wash over me. The heat, the force, the radiation. Fear. It's the end of the world all over again. I close my eyes. I see my life before all of this. Before the bombs. Everything can change in an instant. And the future you plan for yourself shifts whether or not you're ready. At some point, it happens to all of us. This wasn't the world I wanted, but it was the one I found myself in. The Commonwealth. My home. Ripped apart and put back together. I thought, I hoped, I could find my family, cheat time, make us whole again. The way we were. But now I know. I know I can't go back. I know the world has changed, that the road ahead will be hard. This time, I'm ready. Because I know war. War never 
for changes. I can feel it wash over me. The heat, the force, the radiation, the fear. It's the end of the world all over again. I close my eyes. I see my life before all of this, before the bombs. Everything can change in an instant, and the future you plan for yourself shifts whether or not you're ready. At some point, it happens to all of us. This wasn't the world I wanted, but it was the one I found myself in. The Commonwealth. My home. Ripped apart and put back together. I thought, I hoped, I could find my family, cheat time, make us whole again. The way we were. But now I know. I know I can't go back. I know the world has changed. That the road ahead will be hard. This time, I'm ready. Because I know war. Changes.